When did man first realize the value of wool? A few strands of fleece caught on the branches of a thorn bush, a promise of clothing. Someone in the distant past discovered that it repelled moisture, formed an envelope of heat insulation by trapping air, then found that he could spin it, and wondered if, like the sheep, he could fashion from it such a coat for himself. These are the gates of the Royal Hospital in Kilmainham in Dublin. In the 13th century, the Knights Templar built a mill here to wash and finish their woven cloth. It was a little over a mile from the medieval city, and it had one great asset, the River Camac, a continuous supply of water which would later turn the great water wheel and provide power for the machines in the mill. The great wheels are gone now, and the Camac flows gently past on its way to join the Liffey. But there is still a Kilmainham mill, this one, about 150 years old, where the tradition and the craft of the weaver and cloth finisher still flourish. Here are designers and craftsmen who understand wool, who can tease, comb and card the fleece, dye it all colours of the rainbow, spin it, thread it on a loom, and weave it into a cloth to delight the fashion houses of three continents. Earlier in its life, the mill ground corn, later became a soap factory. Then, in 1904, a man named Archer from Huddersfield started a cloth finishing service here, trading as Bates and Company, finally closing in the early 70s. I see, yeah. I wondered if that little square... John O'Loughlin Kennedy and his sister Noreen Pye reopened the mill in 1973. Noreen had a small but successful business in hand-woven tweeds in Dublin, and with her economist brother decided to combine her hand-weaving with a cloth finishing business. Now, with a staff headed by production manager Christy Kelly, Lachlan and Noireen are running a business covering every aspect of the trade, so they can respond quickly and efficiently to changes of taste in the fashion world. Bales of fleece arrive from Bradford, the great wool centre in England. Fleece from all over the world is sorted and blended in Bradford, and is delivered to the mill already washed and scoured, free of dirt, grease and perspiration, so that it is clean and fluffy. This fleece is a blend. It may contain very fine merino wools from Australia, or a slightly coarser New Zealand crossbred, or the stronger and heavier Irish wools. Different climates produce different qualities of wool, because sheep adapt by growing the type of fleece most suitable to the climate they live in. Liam? Liz Rackard and Liam Highland must now weigh the fleece very accurately because achieving exactly the colour the designer wants depends on precise measurements of dye and wool. Yeah. This is the vat in which the dyeing will be done. Wool takes dye beautifully if it is in an acid condition, but not if it is in an alkali condition. So ammonium sulphate is added to the water in the vat making it alkaline. Do you want more over that side, Liz? Yeah. Here, I'll push this over, kid. As the water is heated, the ammonia will boil off and the sulphur will gradually make the wool more and more acid. The idea in this technique is to control the rate at which the dye gets onto the wool, producing an even colour throughout so that the finished cloth will accurately reproduce Noreen Pye's original colour intention. Liz takes a sample of the water in the vat for a pH test to check the acidity. An acid milling dye is carefully weighed out. Liz must know exactly how much dye to add to the batch of fleece in the vat. The dye is first mixed with cold water to make a smooth paste. 
Then dissolve with hot water, and when the temperature of the vat is right, in it goes. Now, as the ammonia boils off, the dye will get onto the fleece gradually, evenly, and fast. The color is checked. And if all is well, the wool is rinsed in cold water. Now it is transferred into what is referred to in the mill as a hydro extractor. We would simply call it a spin dryer. And away goes the water. This is the wool loft. Wool dried naturally in air behaves much better than wool dried in artificial heat. A yarn dyed brown produces a uniform but flat color, but if you mix yellow and orange fibers and add pinches of blue and green to a base of white, you will produce a color which is vibrant and alive. The Fear Not machine breaks the matted fibers apart, roughly mixing the colors together. The wool is fed into the machine in sandwiches of color. A light emulsifying oil helps to lubricate the fleece, aiding the later carding and spinning. The next process will be to comb the fleece out so that the fibers will lie parallel to each other before we begin to spin and twist them into a thread or yarn. So the untangled and multicolored fleece is hoisted up to the carding floor and fed into the hopper of the scribbler, the first section of the large two-part carding machine. The scribbler has rollers covered with coarse wires, which will comb out the fleece in which the fibers are lying in all directions after the turbulence of the fear knot breaking machine. The scribbler forms the fibers into a rope, called a sliver rope, to carry them to the next stage of combing out. At this point, the rope is uneven in texture and thickness, so it is deliberately laid down at right angles to the direction of travel in a section called the scotch feed. Now the second part of the machine, the carder, goes into action. It is much like the scribbler, but with much finer wires on the rollers, and it delivers the fleece like a gossamer web. This is the condenser. Leather tapes divide the web into incredibly thin ribbons of fleece a little over a centimeter wide. Now these ribbons are passed between two oscillating rubber blankets, which roll the ribbon into a string called a slubbing. 
which is then wound onto a large metal bobbin. It is beginning to look like yarn, but it has no strength yet, because all the fibers are lying parallel to each other. Before the yarn can have strength, it must be spun to wind the fibers around each other. For that, it goes to a machine called the mule. This is the best way yet discovered to spin yarn. It was invented by a man called Crompton in 1779, and the principle has never been improved upon. Basically, it is a carriage carrying spindles. The bobbins of slubbing are put onto the machine, and the ends of the slubbing wound round cardboard tubes, which are placed over the spindles. Now the carriage rolls out on rails and draws out a couple of meters of the slubbing, twisting and stretching it as it draws it out. The twist strengthens the thin parts and stretches the thicker parts, thereby evening out the yarn. How much spin you put in depends on the thickness of the yarn and the strength you require. For a yarn for a hand-woven cloth, less twist will give the desired softer, fuller appearance. Whereas a high-speed modern loom will require more twist to cope with the greater tensions in the loom. You can twist clockwise or anti-clockwise, called S-twist and Z-twist. Now, Cathy O'Connell takes the full cops off the spindles on the mule. This is called doffing. The yarn is now spun and is ready for winding onto cones on the winding machine. Each cop holds about 100 grams of yarn and Jimmy O'Reilly and Mary Hunt will use seven or eight cups to wind into a cone weighing about a kilo. This will be easier to handle and to store. Noreen Pye's designs begin as a vision of color but must be translated into exact instructions to the weaver as to the order in which over a thousand yarns must be threaded onto the loom. The dream must become a mathematical reality. And the colors must be exactly right. It's an old saying in the arts, genius is 10% inspiration and 90% perspiration. This is a warping mill. The warp threads are those which run lengthwise down a piece of woven cloth. They have to be wound onto the warping mill in the correct order and number to comply with the pattern and weaving instructions, all at the same degree of tension. If you want a piece of tweed 150 centimeters wide, you will need 1,250 threads running parallel down the length of the cloth. These are wound onto the warping mill in sections of 60 at a time cut off at the precise length, in this case 120 meters, and kept in the correct order by the least ties, or thrum. The reed keeps the warp correctly spaced as it is being wound onto the mill. It's not as easy as it looks. The key to good weaving is in correct warping. Finally, the warp is beamed off, winding the warp off the mill onto the warp beam. We're nearly ready for the weaver. The threads which will run across the width of the material are called the weft. They are wound off the cones onto bobbins, and these will be put in the shuttle which is a little wooden container on wheels, which will be shot from side to side through avenues in the warp called sheds.
Frank Gillespie is a veteran weaver from Donegal, and he prefers to wind his own bobbins by hand on a contraption made from a bicycle wheel. There's a priest from Donegal, Father McGlinchey, who started a whole tweed industry in Korea using bicycle wheels as his spinning wheels. We'll do each sample in the herringbone weave and then we'll do it in the plain weave and just about 26 inches of each. And then Sean Gilday is another Donegal weaver from Ardra. Noreen Pai wants him to repeat a pattern already on the loom. Sean and Christy Grace put the warp beam on the loom. Now Sean has to tie the ends of these 1,250 threads to the 1,250 already on the loom. Right, Sean, that will do you now. He has replaced the thrum with leaf sticks, which will continue to keep the warp threads in order as he begins the arduous task of joining on the warp ends. It calls for great concentration. If Sean misses one, the order is broken, and he has to go back to where the mistake was made. These four wooden frames are called heddles. They support a framework of vertical wires, which have loops called heddle eyes, through which the warp threads pass on their way to the reed, which continues to determine the width of the cloth to be woven, the number of threads, and the texture of the weave. When the new ends have been drawn through the reed, they are tied onto a metal bar on the front beam of the loom, which will collect the woven cloth. Before starting to weave, Sean takes up the slack and gets the tension just right. The temples, which contain little spiked wheels, will keep the woven tweed from pulling in at the edges. When you raise a heddle frame, which is done with a foot pedal, all the threads which are connected to that heddle are lifted up, and all the threads connected to the other heddles drop. This creates an avenue called a shed between the rows of threads. The shuttle with its bobbin of yarn is shot across from one side of the loom to the other, inserting one thread of the weft as it goes. Then the heddle descends, and another heddle is raised by the weaver's foot pedal, forming another shed and trapping the piece of yarn which went across with the shuttle and weaving it into place. The bobbin is empty and a full one has to be loaded into the shuttle. The yarn threaded through. The shuttle slipped back into the shuttle box. Sean is using two shuttles alternately. As the shuttle is shot through the sheds in the warp, drawing the weft with it, it enters the box on the opposite side of the race board and is returned. Sean's left hand on the thumbstick selects which shuttle is to be thrown and operates the sleigh holding the metal reed which tamps home the weft. Both the bobbins are of the same colour so that any variation in the yarn's thickness, quality or colour is averaged out. It's hot in the mill, and weaving is thirsty work. What are you doing up there at the moment, Jeanette? <laughs> that was my boyfriend down in Cork. <laughs> The sign of a great weaver is rhythm. Noreen Pye was asked her opinion of Frank Gillespie. She said, he makes his looms sing. Weaver's feet move the pedals in a certain order, varying with the pattern. Frank is weaving the traditional herringbone using four heddles. 
pattern of the finished cloth depends on what threads go through which eyes on which heddle, and what order the heddles rise and fall, to say nothing of the colours involved, the thickness of the yarn, the number of weft threads per centimetre, and the fact that the weaver may be manipulating two, three, or even four shuttles at the same time. It is a craft which makes playing the organ seem child's play. Even though 120 meters of yarn may be threaded onto the loom at a time, that length of finished cloth will be too heavy for a man to carry, so it is usual to cut the newly woven cloth after 60 meters. <clears throat> Frank and Sean fold the cloth, a process called cuttling before taking it straight into the mending room. Rita Nolan and Phil Long do two jobs in the mending room. First, they give the cloth a very close inspection. Quality control, therefore sales and the reputation of the mill, depend on their alertness here. They also repair and darn in any flaws in the yarn or the cloth. Anywhere one piece of yarn is joined to another, the knot has to be untied and darned in so that there's no sign of any join. Frank Nolan and Peter Gillespie, Frank Gillespie's son, now bring the tweed off to the wash box. Now the oil that was sprayed on the fibres in the breaking machine to aid carding and spinning must be washed out. They sew the ends of the cloth together to form a continuous loop. Soap and soda will be added to the steaming hot water for a soft feel to the cloth. Detergent if you want a harder feel. Then the cloth is milled. In this old machine called the stocks, the cloth is pummeled by two oaken hammers to close the weave and cause it to become felted. In the course of all this treatment, the cloth shrinks slightly, forming marks in the weave called crow's feet. It has to be put onto the tentering machine where it is tensioned both in length and width. Little hooks are attached to the edge of the material. Now you know where the expression on tenter hooks comes from. To be stretched in both directions simultaneously and also dried between steam pipes. Originally, tentering was done out of doors on a wooden frame. There's an area in Dublin's Liberties still known as the tenters since the days it was a great weaving center. Cloth may be finished in many different ways, depending on what the designer has in mind. If you want a fluffy finish, the raising machine 
to lift the pile. But if the material is too hairy or kempy, then the cropping machine is used. It's really a sort of high-powered textile lawnmower. And if it runs away with you, it can do fearsome damage. Finally, the blowing machine, which presses the cloth and relaxes the wool fibers. The material is rolled into the middle of a sandwich of cotton and nylon. Steam is blown through it from the center of the roll, followed by cold air. Combination of temperature and pressure shrinks the cloth, setting the fibers and giving it a smooth, finished surface. What began as an idea of color and pattern in the mind of Noreen Pye is now Irish tweed, destined for one of the great fashion houses of the world. But to the sheep, wrapped in its luxuriant fleece, it must seem a very complicated way of getting an overcoat. <laughs>